And today, if you want to open your Bible, we'll uh, go in just a few moments to Exodus, the 17th chapter, verses 8 through 17. And uh, we are in this Because You Ask series, and uh, the question this week, we're on 28, uh, we'll, get, we'll have uh, two more sermons in the Because You Ask uh, series, and then we are going to A Life of Abraham. Well, uh, somewhere along the last six months or so, someone asked me a question about her, and I wrote it down in my list, and now we get to it, and I don't even remember who asked the question, but we're going to talk about the amazing life and death of her. Sounds kind of odd just to say right there by itself, her. Her who, right? Uh, H-U-R, obviously. In, uh, in English, excuse me, in Hebrew, it is the uh, particular Hebrew letter that has that little bit of a guttural sound. We might even uh, 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 spell it with a C-H like we do the place across the street, Chabad. Uh, so it is the amazing life and death of her. But since uh, Lynn is up somewhat close to the front, we'll probably go with her most of the way. Uh, she's in the splash zone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, we are going to look at this amazing life and death of her. This happens to be her right here, of course. And this is Aaron over here. And this is Moses in that, uh, that, that story that most of us know about Aaron and her holding up the arms of Moses at the uh, battle of uh, the the Amalekites, a battle against the Amalekites at a place called Rephidim. Very shortly after they had made the exodus, this was the first battle that they really had. And this is where we're introduced to her, and we'll talk about him more in a little bit. So we've got a little bit of a biographical sketch on this, uh, this fella, her. It is one of those things of, uh, shall we say, inquiring minds want to know, right? Uh, uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, this fella, her. Why was he chosen? Now, I've already asked, I've been asked twice this morning, is this uh, Ben Hur we're talking about? It is not uh, Ben-Hur we're talking about, but since you brought it up, here is Governor Lou Wallace, General Governor Lou Wallace, the uh, governor, uh, the, the 11th governor of the New Mexico Territory. Uh, we we uh, went through quite a few of them there at the beginning. Uh, some of them uh, did not live to tell about it, but uh, the 11th governor of the New Mexico Territory, 1878 to 1881, he served, uh, appointed by, uh, I want to say Rutherford B. Hayes. I may be off uh, there just a little bit, uh, but uh, uh, served as governor of the New Mexico Territory. And while he was the governor, he lived in, of course, the Palace of the Governors. Next time you go to Santa Fe and uh, you uh, see the Palace of the Governors and you think this is where I buy jewelry and go inside to a museum. Well, that was Governor Lewis's home and the Capitol building. He lived there. While he lived there, in that very building, here's a little trivia for you that you may have forgotten. When you have your friends from North Carolina, wherever they might be, you might say, this is the building where Ben-Hur was written because Governor Lou Wallace of New Mexico wrote Ben-Hur while he was the governor. He was uh, actually doing some, uh, shall we say, soul searching. He had been a general at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, things didn't go well for him at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, he had a lot of uh, uh, bad press uh, from uh, the way he handled the Battle of Shiloh, and it really kind of led him to, uh, uh, to a spiritual uh, search. In that spiritual search, he, uh, he, he made a fictitious character, Ben-Hur. The fictitious character, Ben-Hur, has absolutely nothing to do with the her of the Bible. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when Governor Lou was asked, why did you name your character Ben-Hur? He said, because it was Hebrew and easy to say. And uh, thus his name was Ben-Hur. I, I believe his, his, uh, in the movie, uh, in the movie, excuse me, it was a book, in the novel <laughs> that became a movie, oh, incidentally, I should say, we'll get to the sermon soon, but I should say, it was the number one selling novel of the 19th century and well into the 20th century, and since the time of its publication has never gone out of publication. 
Uh, so it, it, it really did well. And it was, it was kind of a, a soul-searching, if you will, on, uh, on uh, Finding Christ. Of course, uh, the uh, famous movie in the 50s was made. There was one made, I think, in 2015 or something, a remake that was a flop. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, there is Ben-Hur. Does anybody know, you New Mexico historians, uh, where Lew Wallace went after he wrote Ben-Hur and... Uh, and uh, lost his appointment as governor uh, because a Democrat was elected president and uh, they did not uh, want Lou Wallace, the Republican, in. And so he was, what do you call it, unappointed or his, his uh, term ended. He went where? He was, he was disappointed, yes. <laughs> he became the ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, that was, that was kind of the prime ambassadorship outside of maybe England and France in those days, and so he uh, later became the ambassador. He wrote another famous novel back then, but uh, we'll have to save this for Lou Wallace night at, the, at uh, uh, Wednesday night supper sometime. He's an amazing man. Okay, now back to the sermon. All of that was to say that has nothing to do with the sermon. But I knew you were going to be thinking of Ben-Hur when we were talking about her, and that you needed to know that uh, Lou Wallace, uh, the governor of New Mexico, wrote it right here in New Mexico at the Palace of the Governors. Uh, and uh, now we move on into our sermon. <laughs> and uh, with that, we meet the biblical her. Did I finish my sentence a minute ago? I don't think I did. Lou Wallace named his character Judah Ben-Hur. Judah Ben-Hur. Uh, Judah, son of Hur. Now, her was a descendant of Judah, but outside of that, there's uh, no connection other than uh, in the name. So here we come. Uh, a little artwork for you here. Uh, Victory, O oh Lord, was the name of John Everett Millet's uh, picture in 1871. And uh, we have a picture here of uh, Aaron, excuse me, of Moses, of course, his arms being uh, lifted up. And incidentally, a lot of people... Uh, have seen this, I do not. But a lot of people have seen this, and if you look up this particular picture, it'll say, it'll, it'll say something, uh, some, some art, art critic will say something about, this uh, prefigures the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That this is a type of the crucifixion. Type means a foreshadow. I don't see that at all in the story. I think it is uh, uh, wishful thinking, perhaps, or eisegesis, reading our experience in. Of course, we understand Christ was crucified, but a lot of Christian preachers, what they will do with this is say, when his arms were lifted up, the people were saved. Oh, this makes a great evangelistic sermon. If I be lifted up, and there is Jesus Christ with his arms out, and as long as you look to Jesus with his arms out, then you will be saved. It's a good example of how not to use scripture. Uh, that is just reading, sort of spiritualizing, allegorizing uh, scripture. And so if you look, were to look up John Everett Millet, who... Uh, 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 painted a whole bunch of pictures as a French painter, as you could probably guess. And uh, this, uh, they say, was kind of um, a, a turning point in his uh, pictures. He used to do, uh, I don't know, uh, different pictures. Let's just go with that. He went to uh, uh, biblical pictures towards the end of his life and uh, carried uh, these out. Uh, but here's, here's Moses. D I, can you figure out which one her is? Is he in the red or in the black? We have a vote for red and a vote for black. Well, I read what the author said. That would be the only way I know that this is Aaron and this is her. Actually, you should be able to tell immediately which is which. And the reason is that at this time, Aaron was about 83 years old, just a bit younger than Dennis. <laughs> and... Her was, as we're going to see in a moment, about 20 years old. Typically, you can immediately tell the difference between a 20-year-old and an 83-year-old, right? Uh, but let's, uh, let's get into the scripture and let's look at it. And we go to uh, Exodus, the 17th chapter. And uh, let's look in Exodus 17, beginning in verse 8. Arguably, we could begin at the beginning of the chapter and tie some things together. But because we have a time limit, uh, we're going to uh, just... Start in uh, verse 8 of Exodus chapter uh, 
17. I tell you what, let's start with verse 7. Split the difference. How's that? Verse 7. He, Moses, called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Verses 1 through 6 have to do with striking the rock. Because now we're out here in the wilderness, but we don't have any water. And so the people, that's where the people began to complain. They had basically just gotten out of Egypt. They get out there, there's no water. What are we going to do? You've led us out here to die. And Moses gets the instructions to strike the rock. This is where he is obedient, not the other where he wasn't supposed to strike the rock. He does strike the rock. Water gushes forth. And he calls that place, again, Masa and Meribah, uh, saying, again in verse 7, is the Lord among us or not? That's where the, that, that was the, the big question of the people. Is the Lord among us or not? Now, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Can I stop and give some commentary on that? I think uh, the, the, the English word then, then came Amalek, is, is tying these two stories together. Here, I've just, you you were asking the question, is the Lord with us or not? You found out the answer is yes, then came Amalek and fought. Okay, you should have some faith, you should trust, the Lord is with us, he is going to, uh, he is going to uh, fight this battle for us. So then came Amalek and fought with Israel. The word fought there is a, uh, is a very strong word. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Jews would translate the word attacked. Then came Amalek and attacked Israel. It gives this, uh, this idea of, you know, he is, it, it's not something that uh, they just stumble upon a war. Every now and then I suppose you could stumble on a war. But this is one where he, Amalek, came out and attacked uh, Israel Rephidim. There is a passage, I've given it in your outline, I won't go there now, a passage in Deuteronomy that gives us the, uh, what we think Uh, an impression that there was a previous time when Amalek and the Israelites had sort of accidentally bumped into each other and and, uh, had a little rough up there. But uh, this time, it wasn't any accident. Amalek came and attacked. By the way, no doubt, uh, as advanced students of the Taos Theological Seminary, you remember who Amalek was. So we won't need to dig into that. Of course, he was a descendant of... Esau. Yes, I knew you would know it. He was a descendant, a descendant of Esau. Esau and Jacob, or shall we say Esau and Israel. And so there was some, uh, shall we say, bad blood between them a little bit. This was Hatfields and McCoys uh, meeting up. At times they had stumbled upon each other. But this time, uh, you know, Esau, Amalek came and attacked uh, Jacob, Israel. So again, beginning uh, at uh, verse 9, Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. Now, uh, as we uh, look at that, a couple of things that I would like to say. Uh, Joshua clearly by this time, he's about 40 years old, uh, Joshua clearly by this time uh, was already seen as the military leader. Uh, Moses is the um, civil leader, if you will, and Moses is the commander-in-chief over Joshua, but he says, you go out and do it. As a matter of fact, he says, you choose the men to fight. I mean, that's, that's your domain. You go out and do it. You choose the men to fight. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God. Now, this is the rod of God that's got a little story, right? Uh, uh, put the rod down, it turns to a snake, pick the rod up, uh, uh, put, li- lift the rod, and here come the plagues. So when Moses is saying, I'm going to go on the hill and stand there with the rod of God, don't get the picture that Moses is saying, man, I'm 80 years old. I'm just going to hobble up there, barely get out of the way with my stick, and I'm going to use it to rest upon. Uh, He is saying, I am going to go up there and lift it up, and and, and in, in doing so, unleash the power of God. Now, to use an illustration that I'm not sure is exactly right, but let's go ahead and do it, and you can forgive me later. How's that? Peter later was given the keys to the kingdom. What you bind will be, will be bound. What you loose will be loosed. 
and uh, we'll save all that for another day. But in a, in, in a, in a, in a kind of way, how's that? Uh, the rod of God was the original binding and loosing key. Uh, and uh, Moses could take that. So, is the Lord with us or not? Yeah, he's with us, and I'll go up, and we'll win the battle by lifting this rod up in the air. Uh, well, as uh, you remember the story, and we'll continue on. Uh, now, let me say one more thing in verse 9. Uh, uh, in the King James, uh, uh, I'll, I'll stand on the top of the hill with, with the rod of God in mine hand. How many of you say, mine hand? Sounds a little awkward, doesn't it? Uh, I just want you to know that mine and thine... Uh, I don't think there's any other I and E words that are pronouns, uh, that uh, uh, is a, uh, a possessive or a direct object, uh, that uh, it's, uh, it is uh, mine hand, the rod in mine hand. Now you've got an English lesson. And we go on to verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and her went up to the top of the hill. This is the first time we meet her as they uh, go up to the top of the hill with him. Obviously, uh, obviously there's no backstory here. Uh, just out of no, we've seen Moses, obviously. We've seen Aaron, obviously. But where's this guy, her? This is the first time we've ever heard of her. Who's a him? <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new one towards us. And uh, so this is who we're going to meet here. So again, that was uh, verse 10, verse 11. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now again, I would only put this not to any kind of, uh, uh, you know, when he was praising God, when he was saying, I surrender all, uh, you know, all the, all the spiritual applications that when he was looking to the cross, he was, uh, forget all the spiritual allegory. The power of God was in the rod. The rod was the key. I'm not totally even sure. Uh, the way we read it in English, it looks, uh, it looks fairly plain. But I'm not even totally sure he was lifting both hands. Uh, I've heard sermons, and maybe I even preached one back through the years, uh, of, uh, on this passage that, uh, you know, when we praise the Lord, we have victory. We lift our hands up, and uh, that's when the victory comes. I, it may have only been one hand, and he was going back and forth in one hand, but you do that all day, and, uh, you know, he was a little, uh, got, got a little tired, and so one, and when he had one hand up, when he had the other hand up, it could have been that, but nonetheless, when he had the, uh, the, the, the rod up, he prevailed. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. We have that uh, in the picture there, sort of. Uh, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. You see the sunset in the background uh, of the picture there. And uh, Joseph, uh, excuse me, Joshua, I'll add one more little bit of trivia here. His, his name was actually changed to Joshua. It was Hoshea and it became Yehoshua. Very slight change. Uh, here, his name had not yet been changed, but Moses, as he writes it, is writing after the fact and knows him now as Joshua, so it uh, is used there. Now, uh, it, it says that uh, Joshua discomfited Amalek. Don't you hate it when you're discomfited? He discomfited Amalek, and his people with the edge of the sword. Now, the word, uh, the particular word there, uh, discomfited, uh, if you uh, look it up in the English, it means to defeat or destroy. Uh, but uh, it, it does not mean killed. He won the battle, but Amalek is still alive, and the Amalekites are still alive. We know that because later in the Bible, we're going to run into Amalekites, right? But then there is a little promise after Joshua discomfited Amalek, verse 14. It says, the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Now, let me stop right there. It's the end of the day. Amalek goes home with his tail tucked between his legs. 
Joshua goes home kind of victorious, but kind of wondering, I wonder when he's going to come back. And God says, write this down in a book and rehearse it with Joshua. Well, good morning, Joshua. Good to see you. Let's open up the book and let me read one more time. And here it is in 14. Uh, In the middle of verse 14, it says, I will utterly put out of the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Okay. Amalek's going away. He's just not done yet. And uh, later on, we won't get into the story, but later on, uh, Amalek is utterly and totally defeated, as well as the descendants of uh, Amalek. There are no Amalekites on the world today, and the end of the Amalekites does, uh, does come and is fulfilled, if we were to follow that through. Now, verse 15, Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. It's one of these few times where uh, there is uh, an attribute added to the name of Jehovah, Jehovah, uh, it's, it's that uh, name of God that, you, that we don't really know how to pronounce. We're going to go with Jehovah here. Jehovah Nisi. Uh, and uh, that, uh, what it really means, Nisi is banner. The Lord is my banner. Is the Lord with us or not? Well, look up on the hill, and there we see it. You know, in, in uh, days of old, and I suppose this was even true in that day, uh, in days of old, there was the sentryman, remember? Uh, and the sentryman stood at the top of the hill with the flag. And if I can borrow a little bit, you know, uh, uh, by the rocket's red glare and bombs bursting in air, we could see through the night that our flag was still there. Uh, and Moses holding up that rod, that sentry, if you will, that banner, that Nisi, uh, was, uh, was saying to the people, hey, we haven't lost, we're still here. Is the Lord with us? Absolutely, he is with us. He is caring for us. So he, he built that place, uh, a memorial, Jehovah Nisi. Verse 16, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord, uh, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation unto generation. Now, there we see the, uh, uh, the little bit that... Uh, that, that we know about her. But all we know is he's sort of this guy that came along and held up a hand. Okay, good. Anything else that we know from Scripture? This is what we want to know. I brought you a picture of the Adoration of the Golden Calf by Sebastian Bourdon, 1616 to 1671 is when he lived. Uh, we don't know exactly when he painted uh, the picture here of the adoration of the golden calf. Now you say, what in the world does that have to do with Ben-Hur? Excuse me, with her. <laughs> has nothing to do with Ben-Hur. What does it have to do with her? Uh, well, uh, I am, let, let me just put a teaser out there. I don't think her ever saw this. I know he didn't see the picture. I don't think he saw the event Let's uh, see if we can put together some of these things and uh, see what uh, happens as we come along. Now, if you, uh, uh, if, if you remember your, your Exodus timeline, uh, you've got, uh, you know, the Passover, and then they leave right away, and they cross the Red Sea, and they get out to the wilderness, and they run out of water, and they say, is the Lord with us or not? And he strikes the stone, and they get water, uh, you know, is the Lord with us or not? And then here come the Amalekites, and he lifts up the banner, and uh, they win all of that. And it's uh, later, maybe a year later, that Moses goes up onto Mount Horeb, the Mount of God, and he receives the Ten Commandments, but he's up there for those 40 days. And while he is up there, that's when the people say, hey, uh, we've lost our leader, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, he's our only connection to God. I guess we have no God. We should make a God. And so they come to the golden calf. So it is, it is uh, almost, not completely, but almost the next big event event in the Exodus story. Now, we were in Exodus chapter 17. If you're still there, uh, turn over a few pages to Exodus chapter 24, and uh, we will uh, uh, see as this account is beginning, Exodus chapter uh, 24, verse 14. And we see, this is the next time we see her. Exodus 24, 14, he said unto the elders, tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. He's going up on the Mount of God. And behold, Moses says, Aaron and Hur are with you. 
If any man have any matters to do, let him come to them. Now, that means that her, along with Aaron, are in charge of the nation. Well, I don't even know who the guy is, right? I know who Aaron is. I know that Aaron was selected by God to uh, be the priest. I know that, uh, uh, you know, Aaron had been all through the, uh, the, the Pharaoh experience and the Exodus and all that kind of stuff. But her looks like this guy that just stepped in to help hold Moses' arms up. Why, why is he there saying, Aaron and her, that's where you go to. If anything comes up, uh, you go see them. Well, let me ask you, uh, do you remember from your biblical chronology, while Moses was away at the mountain, did anything come up? Yes, a golden calf, as a matter of fact, as they begin to say, he's not coming back, we got to do something, and so they create the golden calf. So this was an issue while Aaron and her were uh, in charge of the country, if you will. And this also would make, because Moses says, he takes Joshua with him, by the way, but Moses says, Aaron's in charge, her's in charge. Whatever you need, go to Aaron and her. That makes her, this guy we've not heard of, to be one of the two most powerful men in the nation. I mean, the, 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 that are there anyway. The other two have gone off on a, uh, a jaunt up the mountain. Uh, who is this guy that is so respected, so powerful in the Hebrew nation, uh, that really you've got Moses, Joshua, Aaron, and her? I suspect... Uh, if we were just to, before, before the sermon time today, if we were to say, I don't know, name the top four uh, leaders of Israel, I suspect you'd get three of them. And the fourth would be, I don't know, who is it, Miriam? Or uh, is it, you know, what, what name are we going to come up with? I, I kind of doubt you would come up with her. Uh, you know, he's, he's obscure. But here he is, he's in charge along with Aaron. Uh, uh, of what we've got here. Now, what do we know about her? Why is he so uh, important? Well, we know that he has, uh, shall we say, a good pedigree. Uh, he was, uh, th there, there is a little bit of uh, argumentation over this, but the best you can tell, we won't go to the scriptures and read it, uh, but you can, they're in the outline. You can study it uh, this afternoon when you do your post-sermon analysis. Uh, you can uh, look at it. Uh, it. Most likely, her is the son of Caleb. Now, we've heard of Caleb. Caleb might even have made it in our top four list if we uh, had uh, gone through that. Caleb, pretty important guy. Caleb, one of the spies. The spies aren't going to go out for about uh, a year from, uh, from, from the uh, golden calf point, but he's, the, he's, he's very likely the son of Caleb. The way I read the scripture, he's the son of Caleb. There are a few people that argue about that, but uh, I think, yeah, he's, he's the son of Caleb. Uh, now, we also know that when Caleb was a spy, and this is told us in the scripture, and again, I've given you the, uh, uh, the, um, the text of scripture somewhere in there, we know that Caleb was 40 years old when he went to do the spying. Well, if you're the son of a 40-year-old, you're not that old. <laughs> this means that her, as I hinted at earlier in the sermon, her is probably about, I'm going to go with 20 years old. Uh, he could be a little younger, he could be a few years older, but, uh, you know, he's not, uh, wherever that other picture was back there, he's, he, he's not someone you might mistake with uh, Aaron. So here, the two guys in charge, you've got one in his 80s and one, ah, let's go ahead and be generous and call him in his 20s. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what it is, the son of Caleb in his 20s. Now, being the son of Caleb, he would have uh, been from a family of some renown, no doubt about it, and uh, they would have uh, known him and, uh, and whatnot. But, uh, you know, okay, uh, so... so uh, uh, there you've got the uh, leadership of Israel. Uh, so now let's add to this. Here's her, comes out of nowhere, and he has a kind of prominent but definitely secondary role in the battle of the Am Amalekites. Uh, seems to me like Moses had a bigger role. Seems to me like Joshua had a bigger role. Seems to me like Aaron and her were kind of uh, um, supporting actors. A little pun there. Did you get it? Supporting actors. 
Uh, <laughs> thank you, John, for laughing. Uh, <laughs> so they were supporting actors. Uh, okay. We're kind of curious who he is. But then when Moses goes up on the mountain and says, you're in charge, all of a sudden we're like, who is this 20-year-old? And then to add to the mystery, we never hear from him again. That's it. It's what we know about the Bible, from the Bible about her. So that, again, leaves me anyway with some curiosity saying, who is this guy and what happened to him? I, I know what happened to Aaron. We're told about the death of Aaron and the burial of Aaron. I know what happened to Moses. I know what happened to Joshua. I know what happened to Miriam. I, you know, you can go through. I know what happened to all those, but her, I don't know what happened to her. Any of you know? Well, there, we search the scriptures, first of all, and we find no answers. It's not there. So, then we say, okay, let's look outside of the scriptures, see if there's any other uh, sources. There is, of course, the famed uh, Jewish historian Josephus. Josephus lived in the first century A.D., so, uh, you know, this would have been 1,500 years later, basically, that Josephus is writing about it. But Josephus uh, actually tells us that her was the husband of Miriam. Uh, that... Um, I, I, I found nobody who agrees. Uh, well, I found one footnote that called her Aaron's brother-in-law. Didn't say anything, it just said Aaron's brother-in-law, her, uh, which would have made him the husband, uh, most likely, of uh, Miriam. Now, uh, I think, and there's a number of places in uh, Josephus where numbers and relationships and uh, things like this, he's not all that accurate on. So most people say, okay, Josephus, he's a nice historian, he tells us something uh, about it, and he's probably somehow related to Miriam, but not there. Most Jewish scholars tell us that uh, uh, it was actually Caleb who was married to Miriam, and Caleb and Miriam had a son named Her. We know from the scripture that her is Caleb's son, no doubt about it. We don't know from the scripture who Caleb's uh, um, wife was, uh, other than the term that is used, at Epaphrath, that is uh, more of a title than it is a name, and so we're a little uh, left confused with that. Now, it could be that Caleb was married to Miriam, but who put Moses into the basket? Miriam. She put Moses in the basket, which makes Miriam older or younger than Moses. You all are brilliant. You're right. <laughs> She's his older sister. Moses is 80, so Miriam is somewhere over 80. Caleb is 40. I did ask Boaz, my uh, Jewish friend, uh, uh, about this. I said, uh, all you Jews say Caleb was married to Miriam. Oh, yes, absolutely. Married to Miriam. I said, uh, he was 40 and she was like maybe 83, 85. What do you say with that? He said, what's old is gold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, you can decide uh, uh, what happens there. I th personally, I think there's, a, there's enough chatter out there <laughs> to say, Somehow, Caleb and her and Miriam are tied together there, uh, probably by marriage. Who was married to who and who, uh, uh, what happened there? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, maybe uh, Caleb wasn't Miriam's son and her Miriam's grandson, perhaps. And, and this might explain, again, why Moses uh, would say, uh, you know, uh, hey, uh, we, l let's go up to the mountain here and uh, come on with me, Aaron, uh, come on with me, her, uh, that they're right there in the same family and that uh, all comes together. Uh, to, to, the bottom line is, we don't really know there. Uh, but the Jewish scholars very consistently in the rabbinical tradition, some Jews reject the rabbinical tradition, but those in the rabbinical tradition, that's uh, most of modern Judaism, if you ask them what happened to her, they will say he was murdered. Now, you and I say, 
I read the Bible a whole bunch of times, and I saw that he went up on the mountain in a supporting role, and he was uh, second in charge. I don't see anything about he was murdered. And again, virtually every uh, Jew, certainly every Orthodox Jew, and if we went across the street to the Chabad and say, what happened to her? The rabbi would say immediately, he was murdered. Well, why was he murdered? Because he tried to stop this from happening. And the people rose up against him, and he was murdered. That would be the, uh, uh, the, the word and the sign that was given. Now, uh, could that have happened? Did that happen? Uh, I, I, I was slow on the draw to bring up Miriam's picture. There she is. Uh, here is 85-year-old Miriam playing the tram, t uh, tambourine. I think they had oil of Olay in those days, uh, but uh, that uh, was uh, done by Anselm. We'll just go with Anselm there uh, in the uh, picture. So somehow I would say Miriam comes into this picture. Uh, and uh, now, was he, was he murdered? I tell you what, uh, let's, uh, let's go. I'm just going to uh, bring up a passage of Scripture on the screen here so that uh, I can point to it a little bit. Uh, let's go to... Uh, Exodus uh, chapter, I know I have a mouse there somewhere, it's wanting to disappear. Let's turn in our Bibles <laughs> to Exodus chapter 32, verse 5. Exodus chapter 32 is the account of the golden calf, and uh, it's a discussion of how it came about. Verse 4, Exodus 32, 4, how he received uh, the, the jewelry, made, uh, made this molten calf. Verse 5 uh, says, When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before the Lord. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So he brings in or the people bring in all of their jewelry. Here's the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the graving tool. Here's the uh, golden calf. Aaron saw it. He built an altar before the Lord, made a proclamation. That's how we know that her was murdered. Well, I thought you would say. I don't see the murder of her in there. Where is it? It's actually in, we discussed this a little this morning in our hermeneutics class, it's in the word saw, uh, verse 5. Aaron, uh, Aaron saw it. Now, it's uh, kind of uh, small print there on your outline, but if you do look at it, uh, I have the word saw and the word feared. Now, Hebrew reads from left to right. And if you uh, start on the left and look through, basically, see that little letter that looks like an apostrophe? In the word saw, there's one of those. In the word feared, there's two of those. That's the difference. That is called a yod, just a little apostrophe kind of looking letter. There's an extra one of those. Other than that, it's all the same. So uh, what the uh, scholars say is you can actually read this either way. You can read it... Aaron saw it and built an altar, or you can read it, Aaron feared and built an altar. Now, even in the built an altar, you can bring uh, the concept of something being slaughtered. In, in the word altar is slaughtered. Uh, and in the word built is also the word bring. Aaron feared that the people had brought a slaughter. This is what the Jewish people will teach. Aaron feared that the people had brought a slaughter. He and her are in charge. We don't see her anymore, but we see that Aaron sees something and decides, let's have a feast tomorrow. And the Jewish idea is that her tried to stop it. Her was slaughtered or murdered, 
Aaron, out of fear, said, okay, tomorrow we'll worship uh, the, uh, the, the, the golden calf. Let's do it tomorrow. Most of them will say that uh, the reason he said tomorrow is he's thinking, maybe Moses will be back by tomorrow. Let's push this off a day and see what we can go. Now, all of that uh, digs in. And uh, uh, how many of you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have I convinced that... Uh, her was uh, murdered at the uh, golden calf. We have, I, I saw one head go kind of like this. I saw one hand go kind of like this. <laughs> so we have a hung jury. <laughs> uh, I don't think we've convinced ourselves yet. Let me say that years ago, I would have been utterly dismissive of the idea altogether. I, I basically would have said, you're getting, up, you're getting way more out of that scripture than that scripture ever said. Now, I have come to recognize over the years that these, shall we call them Jewish traditions or rabbinical teachings, have far more than we just touch the surface with. And it always sounds absolutely ludicrous at the beginning, but the more you read and the more you dig into it, the more you say, huh, oh, that's an interesting connection. Ah, I didn't know you had the videotape. Ah, look at there, there's a smoking gun. And you put all this together, and eventually rabbinical, leaders, uh, rabbinical uh, 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 tradition, uh, and we're talking the Talmud, the Mishnah, all these kind of things, and all the commentaries of the sages down through the ages, you take these things and you say, there's a lot of stuff going on out there, and they, they bring a decent argument. This is one of those things I've sometimes said, uh, um, well, let's think of O.J. Simpson. Remember him? Uh, O.J. Simpson uh, at the criminal trial was uh, acquitted, I, I guess is, would be the word, right? Uh, he was acquitted at the criminal trial. But at the civil trial, he was found guilty, and he had to pay. Why? Because the civil trial doesn't have quite the same standards as the criminal trial. Criminal trial is, uh, what, uh, beyond, uh, uh, what is, what's that? Beyond reasonable doubt, that's right. Well, a civil trial, you can have some reasonable doubt and say, everything points to it, ah, that's what it is. I think we could accuse the Hebrew people of killing her at the golden calf, or at the golden calf incident, and I think we could uh, win some cash in a civil trial. I don't think we're going to make it in a criminal trial, but the good news is we don't have to, because all we're doing is interpreting the Word of God, right? Now, so, again, I would have, years ago, I would have said, ha, huh, that's crazy, you know, you don't know anything. But the, but the problem is, I was not inquisitive enough. The older I get, the more inquisitive I become, right? And now I'm like, well, it is kind of interesting that he just disappeared. I mean, he was put in charge, and now we don't know anything about him or hear anything about him ever again. Uh, what, what happens to the guy? Uh, and, uh, oh, well, here's one plausible statement. And I've also realized that uh, uh, on this Jewish uh, rabbinical literature that you read one and you say, oh, okay, I don't think that's enough, but that's, but that's not, that's not the, uh, the, anything but the beginning of it. When we talk about rabbinical literature, we're talking about libraries and libraries that have written about this very subject. Uh, so we're talking a group of people who for uh, uh, 3,000 years now have been looking at the, all the intricacies of the word of Scripture with a magnifying glass all day long. This is what they do. And, uh, and, and this, I would say, unanimously is the opinion of rabbinical tradition. Could it be that Aaron was murdered because he tried to stop the golden calf? If I was Lou Wallace and wanting to write a movie about the real her, that's what I would put. <laughs> that uh, this is what happened to him. He tried to uh, do the right uh, thing and uh, didn't make it. Now, we tie him in with Miriam. Uh, and uh, here, let's add, let's add one more thing. Because we do, the, the name her does come up a couple of more times in the Bible. Here we have a picture by James Tissot, who was a... Uh, 
devout Roman Catholic, but uh, a lot of his pictures are in Jewish museums. The reason was because he uh, painted uh, pictures of Old Testament scenes and he did them fairly accurately. Here is a picture of the goldsmith, and you'll see why that uh, comes about uh, here in just a moment. If we, uh, you still got your Bible open there, perhaps even to the page with Exodus chapter 31. And uh, let's uh, see in Exodus chapter 31, we started in 17, now we're in 31. It says, uh, the Lord spake unto Moses saying, see, I have called by name Bezaleel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Okay, Bezaleel is Ur's grandson. Verse 3, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in the cutting of stones, to set them... Uh, in uh, carving, to timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And it goes on to uh, speak about uh, this uh, bezalel. I think in jewelry today we still have a bezel, right? Uh, it comes from this. A bezalel is the guy's name. Uh, the grandson of Ur. Next time you look at your watch with the bezel. Is that what, that's what a bezel is? Isn't it the face of the watch? The... Uh, Oh, it's around. It holds the crystal. I'm not the goldsmith. <laughs> but you can, you can think of her. Oh, her grandson. Okay, that, that's what it, that's named after there. Now, it does appear that God selected this guy. And if we read, it's two chapters that uh, you could read. Uh, one of them is, uh, is here that we have looked at. You could also look at Exodus chapter 35, verses 30 through 35. And uh, it goes even in more depth there. It's very clear that not only did God choose this man to be the goldsmith, but God also, I, sh I should say the chief craftsman would be better. He chose him to be the chief craftsman uh, for the nation. But also, he, uh, he, he, he is the one that gave him the skill and the wisdom to know what to do. So God made a jeweler out of Bezalel, if you will, uh, and a craftsman out of Bezalel. Uh, God uh, gave, chose him and then gave him those gifts. Now, Bezalel then is the one that did all of the work for the tabernacle. They built the tabernacle, of course, in Exodus' day, and uh, Bezalel is the one that did it. And uh, one thing we're noted, uh, again, I won't look at the passage, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 5, that the, the, the brazen altar, if you will, that's kind of interesting, going with that golden calf, uh, the brazen altar was made by Bezalel, of course, for the tabernacle. It was used then in Solomon's temple. It's the outside of the Ark of the Covenant. It is the only piece, the only uh, uh, treasure, shall we say, from the tabernacle that we know made it into the temple. This golden altar made by Bezalel himself. It's almost like God says, your granddad tried to stop going to the wrong altar. I'm going to honor your memory by letting, and his memory, by letting you build the altar that all of the sacrifices of the nation of Israel forever are going to be given on uh, up through uh, the days of the, the, the first temple. And uh, you have this, this amazing uh, line of, uh, well, you know, uh, could it be? This amazing life and death of her that we don't know so much about. I kind of like, I don't, I don't know who did this picture, so I just had to, my apologies to whoever it was. Uh, uh, but uh, this one, at least her, looks a little younger and Aaron looks a little older there. And, uh, and uh, Moses is sitting on a rock. Uh, and uh, I... I, I, I I, I preach this sermon to say there's a lot in the Bible that we don't know, but we ought to ask some questions, see, see if we can dig it out. And uh, so, you know, some lessons we can learn. I'm not one that thinks you have to have application to every sermon. I think you can, uh, we ought to feel comfortable just saying, now you know what the Bible says, let's go home uh, and uh, be, be good with that. But here's a few lessons you can take home. And that is we can easily study a lifetime and still have things to learn. Uh, just curious, how many of you never knew that a lot of people out there say Ur was murdered for trying to stop the golden calf? Any of you that didn't know that before this morning? That's what I thought. 
Um, so, so much out there, even things that are factually in the Bible and other things that are built from some innuendo with the Bible and some tradition with the Bible that we look at, and I think we have to say, we can never run out of Bible study. There's, there's, there's no chance of it at all that we are going to uh, you know, come to the uh, end of our uh, ministry or our lives and say, well, I guess I'll have to pick up another book now because I've mastered that one. I know everything about it. And, and, you know, yet the sad thing is, in so many churches across the land, there's so little Bible study even done. Uh, really, you got a lot more uh, uh, study of Oprah than you do, <laughs> and uh, pop psychology uh, and feel-good kind of stuff than you do the study of the Word. Uh, and I remember an old statement that W.A. Criswell used to give. Remember W.A. Criswell? He's the former pope of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, he was pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas for many, many years, and, and of course, deceased now for almost that long. Um, and uh, he, he was giving an illustration one time. He said, you know, I hear these preachers say, pe- say they're Saturday night pacing up and down their study saying, what am I going to preach? What am I going to preach? What am I going to preach? He says, my problem is I study all week and then I'm pacing uh, up and down my study saying, what am I going to leave out? What am I going to leave out? What am I going to leave out? And and it's so true that when we really start studying the Word, it just overflows uh, and and begins this thing in our mind that says, we want to know more, we want to know more, we want to know more. You know, I can tell you one of my problems now is that I put pictures up, and every time I put a picture up, I'm like, well, who's that artist? And then I'm like, well, where did he live? And I'm like, well, who taught him? And I'm like, well, what else did he paint? And before you know it, I've spent 30 minutes looking at James Tussaud, the Catholic, with all his, and, uh, and you get lost in these things. Well, a little bit of knowledge does that, doesn't it? And any subject. And so my point here in the Bible is, wow, there is so much that we could dig into on these stories and learn more and more and more. And number two then, is goes right along with it, is that uh, we ought to have some curiosity. Uh, for, for some reason, my, my uh, feeling anyway is, you come into the church and curio- check your curiosity at the door. Don't put it there. Because you know what curiosity does? It asks questions. And it might not just uh, take your pill and swallow it. <laughs> curiosity says, are you sure of that? Could it be that? Could it possibly be? And, and I think that what Christians ought to do is foster a curiosity. I think one of the best ways to do it with the Word of God is just start asking questions. If you just train yourself to ask questions of a verse you're reading, you'll find that it, it can go uh, endless. And so you read, uh, you know, Aaron was brought up and her, who? I don't know her. Where's her? Who's her? Instead of, we, for, for whatever reason, we've been kind of trained just to say, eh, the guy held up his arm, don't worry about it. Uh, and, and we never ask a question, who is this guy? Where else do we see him? What else can we learn about him? What else has been written about him? Uh, what's out there? And we ought to foster some curiosity. And then I, I think whether, whether the whole scenario is wrong or not, and you can just dismiss it as wrong, but out of curiosity, I'm going to say, then what do you think? <laughs> and I don't really accept, I don't know, let's just move on and have lunch. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you can come up with something better than that, right? So, uh, but, 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 but even if we know only what's in the pages of Scripture, I think you and I can come and say, well, her was definitely a young man who served God nobly and diligently so that even Moses the elder and the statesman of Israel could say, I'll put you in charge while I'm gone. And that's, that's the kind of thing we, we ought to say, hey, I would like more examples of that. I would, uh, I would like to see that. It's one of the reasons, by the way, I don't like uh, some of these pictures uh, we use, like uh, this one, because I don't think that, uh, uh, I don't think we're helping the church at all by making her to be however old that guy in black is. Why don't we make him a young guy that would inspire the other young guys to say, hey, if her can do it, I can do it. And, uh, and, and we ought to set these, uh, these people uh, forth in uh, that uh, kind of manner. Well, with that, it's uh, past time.
time. And her is going to tell me not to preach so long. That was a pun, Dan. <laughs> uh, let, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the scripture and indeed uh, the, the depths of the scripture and how it just keeps on going and going and going where we can learn uh, something, something else, something new, and uh, we can uh, enjoy it again. And uh, we, we, we just are uh, grateful for uh, opening up a possibility. I don't know if we can nail it down if it was truth, dear Heavenly Father, but uh, certainly a, a possibility uh, that's, uh, that, that's plausible and been laid out by a lot of people down through the years. And uh, as we look into it, it does uh, uh, open up the uh, possibilities of our mind of uh, having some curiosity and some intrigue and uh, finding from some of these people even some inspiration for uh, the, the, the world in which we live and in, in, in that, uh, you know, here's a young man that perhaps uh, stood up for his belief uh, even all the way to a martyrdom uh, and uh, began to, uh, uh, to, to try to stop his people and to try to fulfill his leadership role. We're grateful for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, with that, uh, let's uh, close today, but uh, thanks for being here. And Wednesday night, we're going to, uh, 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 let's see, dress 60s? No, on the second hand, don't. Uh, <laughs> but we'll have, uh, we'll have a good 1960s meal and some fun Wednesday night and the Feast of Jubilee and the Feast of Israel. That'll be a fun one to look at. And uh, congratulations to Nathan and Whitney on... Uh, their uh, expectant arrival. Some of you maybe had been wondering, where's Whitney been? Church is in the morning. And she's pregnant. <laughs> That's where she's been. <laughs> uh, but uh, congratulations to uh, those two. Well, let's have a little music. Uh, we'll uh, go out uh, from this place. Thanks for uh, being here. God bless you. You are dismissed. No kids activities this week, but we do have Children's Church next Sunday.